72. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only 72 Patreon members away from achieving our next major milestone on our quest to start a nonprofit. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackham or chatterbait, you can help us achieve these goals. All Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off all their orders to Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off their order to Catoctin Rods. You'll also become a member of our private Facebook group community, be a part of our monthly photo contest giveaways, and of course, members only content. Check out the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. We are having technical difficulties as we do here uh, with our Pennsylvania internet. How's everybody doing tonight? It was a crazy weekend. The first weekend that people are allowed to have boat tournaments on the tidal Potomac. It has been crazy this year with the amount of high wind we've had. It seems like every Saturday, every Sunday, it the weather's just not favorable. This weekend, though, it, it was. And my goodness, was there a lot of boats and kayaks out. Everyone enjoying that weather. We'll be getting into that with uh, some fish reports in about two weeks, I think, is when we're going to talk about just kind of the boat pressure on the tidal Potomac. But I wanted to get, uh, I wanted to venture back up to the mighty Susquehanna River with this guy who was one of, I think, the first guests. Uh, I, we are closing in on 300 episodes in, in less than three years, honestly. And he was like, I think, one of our first 20 guests that we had on. And so we're bringing this guy back, uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Chris Gorsuch. Chris, thank you so much for coming on tonight. You're very welcome. It has been a, a while since we've gotten to speak. Um, and so really the first thing is like, you know, how are you doing and what have you been up to the past year? Well, um, really enjoying this wind that we've had, right? It's not wind and rain. Um, one of the, the unlikely outcomes of wind and rain is usually a little bit more elbow room on the river. So um, I'm learning to embrace it. I mean, today my clients were a little bit disappointed that the wind forecast changed from a very mild six to 10 to a 10 to 20 north winds. And uh, I said, well, you know, one of the advantages will be we'll see a few less boats if this this wind does get bad. And sure enough, and it, it was there was a, a, several boats that pulled in early, but there wasn't that many boats when we came back in the way. So. As, as I get older, I, I, I kind of look back on when I was a kid and and the old gentleman there that would take us out would be like, you know, it, it just didn't used to do this back in my day. And sadly, I'm getting to that age and I'm looking back to last spring and it's like, I don't remember it being so windy and wet in a couple of years. Um, and as a smallmouth guy, you know, we, I think about the Shenandoah River where we had two years with such high flood times right at the spawn and it really affected it. Do you see this having any issues for the Susquehanna fishery? Well, I mean, we had we had um, the Delaware River and the Susquehanna, Virginia, that those fisheries up here. We had those floods in the early 2000s, 2004, I think five and six or four, five, eight. Then we had that 100 year flood in uh, 10 or 11. So we've seen it where we've seen, um, you know, the, the river go through ups and downs, in, you know, because of those. And then we've had all really low years. Like I think it was 2000, 2001, where it was just really, really low. And we've seen that devastate, in, you know, the, the vast population with Colmenares. But um, I think things cycle. I mean, I, I think we're clearly, I mean, we hate to admit it, but I think we're clearly seeing our seasons switch shift a little bit, right? Where December really is not as bad as it used to be. And um I don't know if February is as bad as it used to be either. So, you know, you can fish almost all year long. And I think that, you know, I think we're seeing the swing. The crazy stuff is we're seeing our hottest days and our coldest years, hottest years, coldest years, just a few years apart. You know, I think I did a study that I did in one of my seminars this year where I was taking a look at the hottest days, and hottest years and coldest years. And boy, I'll tell you what, in our top 10 in the last 100 years, I think in the last... 15 years we've had two of each of those top tens right so two of the hottest or warmest years and two of the coldest years in that same 15 year window so it's not like i know the big phrase was global warming but there certainly seems to be a cycle where we're having some kind of a 
climate change in our area. Um, we're we're becoming closer to the big sticks of line up here than people think because we're getting that very mild winters the last couple of winters. And with that, you know, you tend to get more rain and maybe more wind because of what's going on, right? The, the ocean plays a big role. You know that better than anybody. Yeah, yeah. And 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 I, as always, guys, before I answer, uh, asked, really, I want to add to that is like, why, how do you think this will actually affect us going forward? As always, uh, I'm giving away prizes to our sponsors, Tiger Crankbaits and Jake's Bait and Tackle. Ask a good question. If I bring it up on the show, you win the gift card. It's that easy. So ask questions right. away. Um, Segwaying back to what I was saying, like what, I'm sorry, what you were saying earlier, how does these extremes affect things? Um, I was blessed last week for Monday Night Live that I was able to hold a Department of Wildlife Resources for Virginia like seminar on tidal bass fishing. And we talked about SAV and how tidal fluctuations can affect it. Will these blow out if, if we have a lot of sustained rain, will that affect the grass on the Susquehanna? It'll delay it. Right, it'll delay it. It'll probably spread it over time, right? It depends on when it comes, right? So right now we have it. You know, what, what people may not re realize is that three weeks ago we had near 60 degree water. And then it dropped into the low, into the upper 40s. And it's been in that 48 to 55 degree for the last three weeks. But there for a while at the end of March, beginning of April, this was into March. We had you know, the creeks were at 60 something, the river was at 60 or 59, and then it crashed. We had that really big cold thing. I think that does more damage immediately than the the the, the high water, right? Because our high water has been high, but it hasn't it's been right to action stage, but it hasn't been that super terrible stuff, right? So further up river in the north branch, they've been seeing a little bit higher stuff, and we've certainly seen a lot of mud this year. I mean, we're still way, way above what we're supposed to have for rain and our levels are pretty high and a lot of the lakes like for the juniata upper juniata they've been releasing they just stopped releasing a couple of days ago and we're just starting to get you know normalized water on the susquehanna but those fish are they're incredible i mean we've been forced to fish it mostly because out of sheer boredom of sitting more than one day in the house right we've been for we've been fishing it and I don't know that I want to do a trip when the river's at, you know, at or just below the action stage, but it's amazing how many fish you can catch. It's just, you know, it's just dealing with the, the garbage in the water, right? But I mean, I don't think the spawn can sustain it, but the, most of the spawns are, are using the, the creeks. I mean, there's been a number of people who have, you know, have shared with, uh, with us, you know, for years that the creeks are really sustaining some of these bigger rivers. And I think that's true. I mean, I, I, will it cause a problem? I would rather see a flood now, you know, before all that grass gets in there because it'll spread grass and it'll spread that, that Japanese knotweed. Like you won't believe if it, if that stuff starts to go to seed. You know, you what have type a of vegetation flood. are you seeing right now? Or, very or little. It's just very little right now. I and mean, we were, we're just, our, our, our trees up here are just budding. Um, the grass, the grasses are not emerged from the river at all right now. Um, we're, we're behind, I think, a little bit. We were so far ahead coming into the year, but I think this cold, this this colder end of March and early April has set things back. I mean, the the spawn, in my opinion, there's been a few fish that have gone in some of the creeks, and a few fish in in, in the rivers are just not they're not even close yet. They still have another week or two or three before they even start thinking about it. I really do. I mean, we're, we're some areas are closer than others, but I think my water temperature today was forty nine point eight in the morning, and fifty two degrees, fifty three degrees in the afternoon. And last week, when I left the water on um, Friday night, I think it was fifty five. So that dropped five degrees over the last couple of days with the cold, this cold front. So you know, our next full moon is in two and a half weeks. You know, I, I still think that the majority of those fish are going to go then. That, that's really for the biology department, not not for me. I mean, it's a guesswork. I've caught a few fish that were spawned out, but right now they're just, they're, they're packed. They're very, very thick. I had Billy Coles on uh, a month ago down at Smith Mountain Lake, and he keeps a really good journal and documents every year, everything. And he had an interesting hypothesis because down there for the BFLs and for his, his guide service, he feels like it went from like winter 
to spawn time real quick. And there wasn't a long drawn out pre-spawn because of the weather conditions. And he also thinks maybe that somehow the solar eclipse also played some stuff into that messing up with their, with their biorhythms. Do you think all that together is probably why we're seeing what we're seeing now? So some fish have definitely gone. And I, I, I I've talked to friends and said, I think there have been a few confused fish, meaning that they've gone a lot sooner. So some of the creeks got fish a lot sooner than I've ever seen them get, get it before. That was in February. February, the creeks were starting to load up with fish. And when it was warm, those creeks got up temperature really, really fast. But when it's cold at night, they drop really quick because of the volume of water. So I think some of the fish prematurely got on beds. But I don't think it was very successful, and I don't think it was a lot of them, right? I think the fish were in some of these creeks really, really fast. Um, but I don't think that the – I think that they – I love the term that they were tricked into doing something early, but I don't think that it that it helped. I think they pulled back, and I think that we're going to see a big run here in a couple of weeks. I think we're I'm seeing see a, run too. a few yeah. fish with the worn tails. I'm seeing a few fish that with the distended bellies or, you know, where they've, they've laid their eggs. But if I catch, like today we caught 50 something fish and the day before was like 70 something. So if, if I'm honest with what I'm seeing, I'm starting to see a bit more buck bass in the last couple of days, but I'm also starting to see some giants. And we're, we're weighing a few more of our fish just because I'm evaluating some scales for an uh, upcoming article I'm doing. So mm -hmm. just want to see how close these scales are to, to how accurate they really are. And, um, and we're, we're measuring <laughs> Fish are a little heavier than I thought they were. I mean, just, just in the last 10 days, they're actually gaining weight, so which makes me think they're going to pop soon. They can't all be crayfish and small and, and, uh, and, and bait weight. It's a lot of it is just, you know, it's like a pregnant woman type thing, right? It's being held at the right areas. And I think in the next, what I've told people, in the next 10 days is really when you're going to start to see some of these really, really heavy fish, you know, before you get into November. You were testing scales. Can we get like a, yeah. a, a sneak peek of the article? I don't want to spoil anything. <laughs> no, I'm just looking at some of the higher end ones. We're not going crazy. We're, we're just looking at some of the digital scales that have, you know, memory and memory. And some of the, we're comparing some that do the, the decimal point and some that do the pounds and the ounces. And so we're looking at them to see, you know, grabbing two of them off the shelf and then using both on the same fish real quick, you know, just to, just having them set up and then, um, we're doing some tests between one brand A versus brand B as well to make sure that, you know, so you have, we're testing them against themselves to see how accurate they are. You know, one, one out of a package and another one out of the package. And then um, we're doing them side by side just to see how close they are. Because, you know, my biggest problem is that if someone measures a fish that's 21 and a half inches, everybody usually gets the same scale. that says it's 20, you know, the same measurement, 21 and a half inches. But my large mouth guys go, well, how much did it weigh? It's like, man, I have no idea. But it's, it's, it's knowing that if you're looking at some of these tournaments that they're having, they're weighing fish, you know, we're, we're, are they, are they, it just seems to be more, less suspect if you just go by the length, but it is kind of interesting to know what the weights of some of these things are. So I was curious, I'm seeing a lot of people who, you know, claim they're catching certain size fish and I won't give you the sizes or anything, but we've been measuring a lot of our fish, just, just trying to do it as part of just this article and, it's interesting that it's a little closer than I thought it was going to be. It's not as off, as far off as I thought it would be. Now we're using only digital scales and we're using, you know, I think right now we, we've looked at three, but I'm looking forward to it. The, the article still has a way to go. There, there is a little bit of a difference. So. It's interesting because we brought it up, um, you know, for, for everyone listening right now, we got about 45 people kind of piling in here. Um, you know, please like, Please like it wherever you are, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or Instagram. It helps push in the algorithm. Uh, I'm on the Black Bass Advisory Board for Maryland, so we help with legislation and stuff there. And the big push is really that that tournaments, the weigh-in tournaments, they're going to be modified in the future at some point, whether it's five years, 10 years, or whatever. I think, and this is what the big argument is, is how can you do a weigh-in format like the kayakers do? Because they do catch photo release. How can you implement a catch way release? Like now in major league fishing, that's one thing because you can pay a dude to be in the boat with you, but for the common men, you can't. Do you think there's a scale technology that could eventually get here that allow for that? Um, not inexpensively, I don't think, right? Because even if the fish bounces around a little bit, right? It's, um, 
I, I like the measurement and I like algorithms that are based off the measurement. And I like the fact that they can do it. They, they can put the fish in a certain way and hold it down. And you've got your camera guys are pretty good at that. Um, you know, it would be interesting to see if they could, because you know how the light is with these things, taking a picture of it with the fish, it just gets, it gets tough in a, in a kayak. Well, you know, bless those guys. They, they, to get those pictures and those shots, that takes a lot. It really does. It's, not as easy as it looks, let me tell you that, with a fish in your lap and that thing in your lap and hold the camera and making sure your card is there. That's that's a that's a technique. So it's easy for me in the boat because I have guys who are just they're just fishing. They land the fish and then I can just really quick before I release it, put it up. I have I have them set up. They're always on. I'm going through batteries like crazy because I always have them on so I can just quick get a measurement, grab the other one, get a measurement and then just you know, take a little, little note on my on my cell phone as to what what size they were and. Some of these are great because they hold the top five, ten, eight fish that you have. And it's kind of fun at the end of the day to say, hey, your top fish were X, Y, Z, and this was your weight for the day, which is kind of fun. We got, we got Matthew really stating the first thing here. Um, fish limits are set off length. Why not tournaments? I like catch photo release. There is something built into our brains as anglers. Maybe this is because of Ray Scott back in the day. Uh, it's weight is a factor there. It, it is there. There's something. I don't know, Chris. I really, I, I've thought I feel well, I, mean, I can give you, I can give you, give you an example here. Right. So, uh, on our, we had an incredible day Friday with size and I don't want to, I mean, I'm sure everybody who fished on Friday had an incredible day size, but it was just, uh, we had 10 bass over 19 inches and some that were as big as almost 22. So just, that's just not a common day for me. But we had a 20 and three quarters, way more, significantly more than a 20 and 21 and a half, to give you an example. So both spectacular fish, both beautiful fish, but one just was gigantuan. It was just thick, right? Just a thick bass. Both were beautiful. Both were trophies. Just, but if you're looking at it, one would have won the length thing, but not the weight thing. So I think that's always a discrepancy for some people. And I've had, you know, I've had some 19s that were caught that were thin either because they had just spawned or they just, you know, they just didn't have the same genetics that some of these other fish have. And I've seen clients go, well, that's a nice fish, but it's not as nice as that other 19. So to answer the question, I like length. I like length as a, as a gauge. Um, but I think that um, what, what people who are using length, they usually use the number of quarter inches, you know, or the number of inches as, as a, as a, as a guide <laughs> or they use a cross reference for a 19 inch fish will be three pounds, nine ounces, for example, or whatever the, it comes out to on the chart. And then everybody uses that as their, their, their weight. The reality is, is that every 19 is different, right? There, there's a, there's a range, but everyone is different. And then once in a while you'll get these 19s that will weigh more than a small 20. So, you know, it's just one of those things where I think that's why the weight is, is, is the desirable thing here. But catch photo release with a putting it on one of those either catching boards or one of the other cradling boards. There's no faster way to measure a fish than that. No safer way, right? You dip in the water, you put your fish on there, you nose them up to the, the buck board, and boy, you've got your your your, uh, your size right away. So we got some questions off Instagram. Uh, as always, guys, if you want me to show your question, uh, StreamYards does not let me share Instagram or Twitter because it's stupid. So I'll just read this one off. But if you'd like your comment to be posted up on there, go to YouTube or Facebook. Uh, Hidden Rivers Journal says, uh, I can't watch now. Will this be uploaded? I could listen to Chris for hours. Yes, this will be re-uploaded tomorrow morning as a podcast and back on YouTube. It'll be also be on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Amazon Music. We have a PA Kayak Bassin. Uh, creeks were running 61 last week. And then let's see, I think there was one more good question. Ah, here we go. Always bent fishing OC. We did well at Deer Creek last week, small and large mouth. The high water was neat to see. Yeah. I've never fished there really in, uh, in super duper high water before. Like, will they actually hold off re like regardless of water temperature and time? If the water stays high, will they hold off because they're not used to those water conditions? Mm, I just think, I think they go to where they're comfortable. I mean, I really do. It's, it's certainly while I won't and, 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 and other things that use current, but I don't think the bass will. I think they're going to, they'd like to do it. They like to be at their home water, right? And they'll hold off as long as they can, but genetically 
when she's ready to go, she's just going to go. So I don't believe that they'll not do it in high water. I just think that they'll they'll look for the nests that that are there. There's there's places where even in the middle of the river that you can't get to when the water's high, but those fish are protected enough in there to to to, to drop. So with the creeks, the hard part with the creeks is that a lot of these fish that enter the creek earlier in the year, they might be, and this is going to sound crazy, and I'll probably get some hate mail for it, but some of these fish are going to be eight, eight, nine, ten miles up into that creek, places where you can't get to easily by jet boat. And, of course, guys who are drifting or kayakers who want to put up river and come down, they know this to be very true, right? That there's some really big river fish way, way up. Um, I just know from some of my friends who fly fish and they do float trips, um, there's fish in some of these rivers, some of these creeks, these bigger creeks, that are clearly 12, 13 miles up from the, from the mouth of the river, you know, where, the, where, they, where it enters the river, the confluence. And they're when way up. When we say creek, because I, I think it's like, so you have the Susquehanna, but then you also have the Juliata. And I've yeah, heard so the Juliata the, is a big creek to them. That's a big creek. That's okay. Cool. And, then, and then creeks from there are creeks to, to it also, right? So you have dozens and dozens and dozens of creeks there. When I usually say creek, though, I'm talking about, you know, the Cotton de Gwinnett, the Sherman's Creek, uh, Little Juniata, which is kind of a small one. Um, there's a bunch of really, like, tiny creeks like Powell's and the Armstrong. And and then there's some larger ones like Penn's Creek. And, you know, of course, you've got the Juniata and then branches of the Juniata. Those are all, they're all tributaries to, to the river. So, but I think when most people are talking about creeks, they're talking much smaller than the Juniata. Right? So they're talking... Some of these other creeks and some of the creeks, you know, when the water's high, you could go 15 miles on a jet boat if you wanted to. Um, the question is, should you? But it is you could, right? And then um, most of the creeks, you know, when it's normalized, you can go up them one, two, three, four miles. And um, and usually the bass will go up until where they're comfortable. So each year may be different. Maybe they maybe they're drawing up, but I mean I know that there's you know, within the first 500 yards of a creek, there's spawning fish. And I know that eight miles up, there's spawning fish. So what drives each of them up to a different, you know, direction, I'm not really sure. But whether it's, you know, genetically they were born there, so they go back there. And certain years when they can't, then they lay their eggs in a, in a, in a different area. And then those eggs are genetically disposed to, you know, only going up two or three miles, maybe. I'm not really sure how it works. I would I be fibbing if I said that. It sounds like you got that that salmon vibe with them that they almost go back to where. I think that's all. I think is very true. But if if there's something that that's catastrophic, like a flood or something where they can't get up there, or you don't get the rain where they can get up there, but you know, I can usually I can usually time the creeks. I know the creeks for my notes. Which creeks gets fish first? Which ones get them last? And I pretty much know what when the water temperature on the main river is a certain temperature. I know after a certain amount of water comes into the river whether it's rain or ice melt that those fish are going to go up those creeks i mean you can almost set your calendar by it if you if you're in late february and you've got the temperatures at a certain a certain level and you get a blast of warm rain and it ra raises the creeks and the rivers you'll get an influx of, of fish late february into these creeks some of these early creeks and some of the other creeks don't even get a fish until like mid-April. Some of the creeks are just getting fish right now. Wow. Yeah. There's, you know, the colder creeks, the the creeks that are, you know, the more trout type stream creeks that are true limestone creeks. They're getting, they're, they've only been getting their fish for the last couple of weeks. What about the uh, Ju uh, Juliata? We have... Uh... Juniata. I know the comment section here. My apologies. My my Virginian okay. pronunciation, as Matthew says, there is no Julie here. Yes, Juniata. <laughs> thank you. Uh, PA Kayak Bassing says, what about the Juniata? What is happening there right now when it comes to fish migration? Uh, the Juniata is a pretty hot spot right now. I mean, it, it, it was difficult to fish last week because Racetown was releasing water. So it was it was at a higher level than most people are comfortable fishing, especially from a paddlecraft. But that's pretty much off the hook right now. I think people are finding an extremely good bite in the junior right now. I've had Ethan on uh, from New River Guide Service, and we talk about how most of the New River is 
is subject to Clater Lake Dam. And that really keeps it like a very unique thing because it's very consistent with its levels, generally speaking. The water runs a little bit cooler because it has that really big reservoir that pulls water. How does having a a raised town right there affect Juniata compared to the other part of the Susquehanna? Does it just always run colder? Are the fish a little bit different there? No, I think it runs a little warmer. I think the, the dam releases water from underneath. You know, so in the summertime it can be cooler, in the wintertime it's warmer. So, because it's a where it releases in the dam, it releases it when the water's you know in the wintertime, the water's warmer on the bottom of the surface, right? So, it's really releasing warmer water than what the cold winter would, would be offering the the flow. So it's a little bit warmer on average than the Juniata. Juniata is than the Susquehanna. Um, the Juniata's biggest problem over the last twenty years is the amount of grass that it has. So the lower, lower eight, nine miles of that river, it's pretty grassy. It's pretty grassy. It's been growing. I mean, I remember in my youth, it being grassy, but not like this. I mean, it, it's choked some summers. It's just absolutely choked, which is good for the fish, tough for the fishermen. It's very tough to get your bait to the fish, right? Not getting caught up in it. And some people have some pretty cool techniques, but the Juniata, I think, is helping hold the population of the fish. I think it's one of those great tributaries that just, it has a lot of tributaries on its own. So if the years are high, it's got a lot of support fish and it's got a lot of fish in it. And this time of year, its population is probably double because of all the fish that come into it from the the Susquehanna. So does that make sense? Yeah, we've talked about agnosium on this show, the importance of SAV. And maybe it's a chicken or the egg thing, but is the reason the Juniata is so hot right now, how much of it has to do just because it has such healthy subaquatic vegetation? Yeah, that's a good question. There's, I can just tell you this. There's, there, there, was, there was reports that went out about the Susquehanna River being you know, in peril or in trouble with its pollution. And I'm not, not knocking it because... We all know that, you know, the housing, those houses are constantly going up and that the sewer treatment plants are not designed to take care of some of the micro stuff that there's out there, right? Especially some of the, the drugs and stuff that are out there. So there, 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 is, there is a level of pollution in Susquehanna that, that is true. It's, it's quite evident, right? And there are populations of fish that are disappearing from it that they are called indicators like... Um, I think the there was a conversation not too long ago about where did all the rock bass go? And you know, some people and I I, I have to be honest with you, I you know, well, it's just those flathead catfish that probably ate all them things. But the truth of the matter is, is that they they were declining before the the catfish were there. So there are some indicators. There are some in, indicators that the river isn't isn't necessarily as as um, as clean as we would like it. But boy, you you cannot argue the amount of the amount of forage in that river. They just there's so many crayfish. There's so many the balls of you know the the, the bait balls of minnows that I have seen this year, mostly the, the emerald shiners. I don't think I've ever in the last two years. I don't think I've ever seen that many just gigantic bait balls of emerald shiners in the rivers like I like I have in the last two years. I mean, I've always seen them, but not as frequently. And it's been higher so harder to see them and yet i'm still seeing them there was a gigantic one it had to be almost five or six feet in diameter i'm looking at it and the way that the minnows are moving it looks like there's grass and i'm thinking there can't be grass growing here there hasn't there's not enough the grass hasn't had a chance to really grow yet and i'm looking at these things waving in the you know in in the, the this pool that i'm behind and then i realized it's not grass at all it's these emerald shiners are just they just look like gra- they're just almost still in one gigantic ball, but they were just moving and swaying like grass would, like eel grass would. And it was just under the surface, and it's like, wow, that's 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 a big group of fish. And then they would disperse, and you know what was dispersing was probably some kind of a game fish that was dispersing them. But it was just interesting to see. And I mean, every day I'm seeing just gigantic, you know, great big bait balls like you would see on the ocean, right? Just just so amazing cool. how much is out there. And the fish get on the boat. I have to clean it every day. There's just crayfish parts and minnows and you know other aquatic insects. It's just they're just full. They're just full. That's so, so. freaking cool. Um, 
a question that I've I've had a lot in my comments section, and I've had people reach out to me for some reason just to complain that, you know, there, there's too many jet boaters out there. There's too many kayaks now. The river is completely pressured. You know, 400 years ago when I was fishing, it didn't fish like this. But then I have then I have biologists come on, and people like you say, Look, there's bait everywhere. There's fish everywhere. And it's like, I think between the two extremes of the argument, there's probably the medi medium ground, and that's probably what reality is. Like, where are we in 2024? I think there's more fishing pressure than ever before, right? And I think that there's, it could be, I think it those and you're all accurate, right? I mean, there's more kayaks, there's more jet boats, there's more people who are working from home, right? There's more freedom in, in people's daily um, daily work than there was ever now. It's very popular. You know, shows like this, my writing, things like that, it's a very popular sport. Um, I don't think it harms the fish. I mean, I, I would like to, but years ago, I was so worried about it harming the fish. I would, I, they just turn off. They, they'll get tired of, you'll move them, right? They'll, they'll, they'll get tired of eating. They'll get tired of moving. They'll get tired of being pressured. And they'll just move and you'll have to go find them. Is it, is it convenient for them in the wintertime? Probably not, right? That's probably the worst time to, to be targeting them. And I would like to say that I don't do that, but I do enjoy fishing in the winter. I don't guide in the winter, but, and there is less pressure. But these fish, they're amazing. They're, they'll they'll move. I mean, they're just day to day. They get pressured. If someone if someone fishes that hole hard and another person comes in and hits it, you know, they're going to stay or they're going to go, and they'll just turn off. They'll just they'll just turn off. I mean, I've I've seen them. You know, I've seen them self educate. So I, I just think that that there's these there's a lot of pressure, but the the fish don't seem to be a, a at, at a harm for it. I My mean, hot take on that though is because you're so right i think if you had to pick a season to shut down it wouldn't for, for river smallmouth i'm gonna preface this it wouldn't be the spawn it'd be the winter because how much they congregate in a couple of areas that can get just bombarded i saw this on the upper potomac when they had a tournament out of hancock maryland we know the eddy everyone there it's like it's right there and you have a thousand boats on top of them i mean right. it, it, it it could potentially be an issue compared to the spawn yeah, I mean, no, but as soon as you bring up the word canceling something, I really like the old, I, mean, I personally really like the old, sometime in May, shut it down for four or five weeks and do it. The problem is that sometimes that the, in those years that they had the moratorium, you know, that the, you couldn't fish for bass, right? You had people doing it anyway because they said, well, I'm not really fishing for bass, right? So I'm fishing for walleye because it's a great walleye. Out behind these rocks in the middle of the river, there's, there's a great walleye fish there. But, um, you know, the, the, the Pennsylvania law enforcement, the Fish Commission basically said there's almost no way for us to enforce it, so we're just going to drop it. And I, I, I like many, immediately thought that that was going to be a, a very bad, right? But I think that most anglers kind of recognize that picking on the betting, the betting males and females, which are very short period of time when they're together, and then picking on the males afterwards is kind of a mistake. And most people don't want to catch those males. I mean, some people do, right? Some some people do. Um, you know, I, I, I've been with so many different people in so many different states have lots of different views on it. If you have a huge bird population, if you have cormorants and you have mergansers and you have, um, you know, loons and other things, there, some of these birds are beautiful to look at, like the loons and stuff like that, but you got to recognize how big of a fish that they can they can devour. So hmm. if you're an angler and you're disrupting, you know, 30, 40 cormorants on a big rock in a spawning area, you're helping that spawning situation. You're not hurting. But you also have to police yourself, right? So just I think people know where the spawning areas are and it's you know to stay away from it, it during those they're on and off the bed so fast in the river. It's just such a different thing. I mean, I, I have spawning areas I check. I won't start checking them yet, but I'll start checking them just to see. And just because fish are in there doesn't mean the fish are spawning. There's a very, very distinct area where these fish are going to be. And if you're in the current or on the current scene, you're not fishing for these. If you're on the current seams, I'm just telling you, you're not fishing for spawning fish. That's just a rule. You're behind an eddy in a gigantic area, and there's a giant eddy, and you're throwing up towards that, and the fish are spawning at that time, you're catching spawning fish. If you're hooking and fish in the back of the heads, or if you're feeling fish, pick your bait up, and you go to set it, and that fish is not there. That is a fish that has picked the bait off the nest and has moved it. Move on. You don't want those fish anyway. You want the bigger ones throughout the currency. 
and it's interesting because I feel like it it I think with any laws that get passed, it's a case by case situation. You know, classic example is when they were trying to ban spawning on like the tidal Potomac, and there's been so oh. many studies done agnosium saying like it, it spawning like fishing the spawn does not affect the fishing population. Statistically, it's not going to affect it. But then you go to like Lake Erie or, or the Great Lakes where those smallmouth are so aggressive where you could stick them. They're going to go right back to the nest to stick them again. And they're like, no, actually we probably should ban it here because it does impact them. Um, I, I really don't like when people on social media or people in legislation are like, well, let's just do a broadband something. It's like, it's that never really works. It should be a case by case basis. And at least that's what I'm seeing with, with working with Maryland for sure. It's people are passionate on both sides of it and they both have really good arguments on it. It really, it, it's like I said, I, I was, in favor of shutting down the, the, the big river. Um, the problem is, is that when they did that, those of us that wanted to fish went 40 miles up river and put pressure on those fish. So, you know, I, I don't really have a solution. It's, it's a cause and effect. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it, the best thing is to police yourself. Right. And we all know how valuable the fishery is. So if you can police yourself, I think you're better off at it. Just, just, just police yourself. And we got a we got a question here for Matthew, actually. Here we go. And then as always, guys, ask a question and you're gonna win a prize tonight. I got Matthew says, How long does it take the for water released from Raystown to reach the Susquehanna? That's a great question. That's a really good question. So you can look at the charts. If you look at the charts this week, you'll last week you'll see exactly how long. Because as soon as they turned it off, you can see it start to drop up river. Like if you look at um if if you you check up river and see where that where that water is, and then check the three the three ledges down, the three volumes. Down. You'll see that go. It it could probably be. It's going to be overnight. We're going to start to see it in some places, even though it's you know significantly fall. But once that faucet's turned off, once that dam release is turned off, it's just a matter of a couple of days, and that river will go. It was just stuck at ten at the Newport gauge forever. It just like everything else was dropping, but the Newport gauge was at ten, and they were releasing a specific volume. And the moment that they drop that volume down to like, you know, 75 or 80 percent of what they were they were doing, it was only a matter of days before not only was it down, but it was actually clearing. So it 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 only took a couple of days. It's um, short of looking at it on the on the website. I'd say two days. And just it's a long distance, but it just it's just it just happens because they're just releasing. It's just a big wall of water. They, they cut it down, and it just it starts immediately dropping where they have it and it just runs right down there. So it's only a matter of a day or two once they stop doing it. And they used to actually, I don't know if they still do or not, but they used to actually have a report that would say, you know, due to seven inches of rain, we're going to be releasing at this volume. You know, the Corps of Engineers are release this volume for this many days and then they're going to turn it off. But right now it's it's near perfect. I'll just tell you that much. Oh, we got another Brandon, uh let's see, what are the most important water gauges to check? Brandon, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bay and Tackle. That's a good question. So I'm assuming, Brandon, do you mean like if you're like going out, like which ones above and below your spot, I guess? I'm assuming that's what he means. So specifically for the, the Susquehanna, I mean, I'm going to speak to my own area. So anything anything below the Clarksbury Bridge, I think you really need to be using the Harrisburg gauge. And you have to, when you look at the Harrisburg gauge, you may want to start to look at the Juniata to make sure that Juniata's not peaking like you know if the junior rat junior is really high and the susquehanna is low due to a it could be due to a release um generally if they're releasing out of the juniata you know if you trust the harrisburg gauge say the harrisburg gauge is at 4.5 and juniata is releasing in the summertime and you think oh at 4.5 i can run anywhere i want to and you go up north above where the juniata comes in into clark's Ferry bridge there if you go above that, you're gonna that river is gonna look like 3.5 because it's not getting that flow that's coming down from Raystown. So you gotta you gotta keep both of them in your mind and know where they are. Usually, you know, in the summertime, you know, if if the Juniata is sorry, if the, the, the Harrisburg is reading 3.9, you're somewhere around 7.8 to, to eight foot at, at, at the Sunbury gauge. So keeping those three gauges in mind kind of help you know that you know this is having having the gauge and understanding where each one is because the Juniata will impact the lower gauge in Harrisburg, but have no impact, impact up river. And I've had people say, man, I ran this 70 years ago at four foot and I had no problem today. I hit and I busted my intake on my jet boat 
what happened? And I said, well, because the, the Juniata is running high, it's giving a false reading on the, the Harrisburg gauge hmm. if you're above that point. So you've got this water that's flowing in, and you think you're running at 4, 4.1, but really it's probably 3.5 or lower upriver. And, you know, you, you ran the same line you did last year at 4, but it's not the same. You need to be looking at what the Sunbury gauge is. Dude, that is the absolute juice. We got another. This is going to be probably a, a six-hour conversation with this question. <laughs> Let me try it. This one's on Instagram by uh, God help me with my Kud199. Kud199 asks, what do you change first? The color, the size, or the style of bait? That's a great question. Um, so... Here, here's what I will tell you. If, if you're working as, if you're working a finesse bait, you're working a finesse bait, and you're you're getting pickups, but you're not getting as many as you. I, I will change color, right? I'll change color. I'll change size a little bit, but color usually goes first, right? I'm usually trying to find the right color for the water color to try to match it, or what the bait is. Um, profile is very important, especially with the Ned rigs now. Ned rigs, Ned bugs, Ned bombs, Ned this, Ned that. <laughs> You know, there's all kinds of different profiles you can throw. Some of the little baby creatures you got are fantastic. You know, there's just the shape, the shape can just turn fish on. Today our shape was we were throwing tubes and it kind of went kind of went um off. The guy reeled a tube in on the way in, he got smashed by a bass. It's like, okay, we're throwing swim baits and we're gonna throw crank baits and moving baits and spinner baits and things. And that worked out really well for a while. So you know, that fish telling us when we reel the, the, the finesse bait, the tube in, right? That, oh, we now throw something else. We throw swim baits, we can throw chatter baits, we can throw other things. And then when that bite died down, we started to go back. And then for whatever reason, our bite just went, you know, we, the morning bite was great. The, the, the middle of the day bite was so-so. And then we had this, this lull at about two o'clock, what's happening. And we started playing around with different things. And we found a little, you know, the, the, the Ned bug or whatever it's called, you know, it, 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 in a certain color was just boom it just we got like 16 fish like like that so it's just playing around and trying to find it it's nice i i love you know that a lot of clients like to take a lot of a lot of guides like to take one client out because it's easier but for me i'd rather have two because i want two fishing rods going at the same time and i don't want anybody throwing the same thing until we really have a pattern that's 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 like that's locked in so you know, usually in the morning, I'll start off somebody who wants to fish finesse to fish finesse and somebody else that wants to fish a little bit more um, power fishing, if you will. So you just have those days. I will play a lot, right? If you're not catching, I'm changing. If we're not catching, I'm changing location. I'm changing the type of water I'm fishing. I'm typing the type of baits I'm throwing. I'm changing a lot. And then once I find it, I don't change it until something breaks, right? I don't, mm -hmm. once it works, you know, if, if the clients are going to listen to my direction is once it's worked, don't change it, right? That's that, that's what they're dialed into that day. That's what we're going to fish. And then as soon as it slows down, I'm changing. I'm changing locations. I'm changing deliveries. And I mean, even to the point where I, let's say I've got a great hole. I know the fish are in there. I like to fish it from the west side. And, and I usually catch them from the west side. If something happens, if the wind's acting differently, I'll go to the east side and fish that hole completely different. And you'd be surprised after striking out of that hole just by moving the boat up and around and getting on the opposite side and changing my angle yep. with the same exact bait, how I'll, I mean, I'll go from catching one fish and sitting there going, where, what are we doing wrong to just moving the boat? I'm not coming back later in the day. I'm just moving the boat immediately over to the other side and say, okay, guys, I know this is going to sound crazy, but just would you put me a paper and throw in there from this direction? And you'd be surprised how many times we get lit up. Like, wow, they just wanted it coming you know, whether the wind was impacting the bait that was impacting the direction that they were looking or if they just were s s staged differently behind some kind of a rock or a tree floated in there or something. But it just know that just sometimes just changing the angle of positions, you know, that, that that makes just a big difference. It makes an absolute so, massive difference. And I, and I mean, you, you, you there, there, there is really no book. I will change. If I'm getting hit on if I'm getting hit on a color hit and I'm not getting hookups, I will change size, right? If it's a jerk bait and I'm getting hit but not getting lit lit up, like we're not connecting, I've got their interest, but I gotta know if it's gonna be size or color. That's a more difficult thing than when it comes to soft plastics, right? I mean, because not only when you shift the color and the size of the bait, you now might be out of their zone for striking. So I like 
you know, if I've got a size that they're hitting, but they're not, they're not, they're not completely buying into it. They're not taking it. I'll change the, the, the color over the size because I want that bait to be down the same area in that strike zone. Where with this, with a, with a finesse bite, you're usually right on the bottom. So if they, if they're not eating it and then someone throws a bitsy tube and they're getting crushed, it's like, okay, it's the same exact color. It's a size thing for them. So and yeah, I, and I, I, I go both directions. I'd also add in uh, to your question, boss, um, the vibration and also treble hook versus a single hook. And I think there's like, there's pros and cons to both. There are sometimes like example is tidal Potomac when I can't get them on a swim jig or a chatterbait because they're not taking it right. And I just know if I switch to a lipless or a crankbait, I'm going to get 6% more fish to the boat just because they're not eating it correctly. And maybe it's a confidence thing versus if I just switch colors or, or something like that. But I'm amazed at how many people do not throw a crankbait. I am amazed at how many people get in my boat. They kind of work. Oh, I've never, I haven't thrown one of these since I was a kid. You know, the guy's 60, 70 years old. And it's like, well, today you're going to be throwing them because this is what they're eating. And um, I mean, if, <laughs> if I need to find fish, I don't care, you know, from 45 degrees on up. So from March through November, even into early December, I'm going to throw some kind of a crankbait. And I've learned my lesson not to throw it when it's cold. I mean, it, it, the crankbait is just, it gets a bite even when the fish isn't even hungry. Okay? It just chases it down and eats it. It's it's probably one of the most consi consistent baits for me on this river all year long. I always have one tie on. It, it, think, unless it's like early February, I have a crankbait tie on. Do, do you think the problem is from an angler standpoint, there is now so many spinner bait, chatter bait, jerk bait, <laughs> you know, like crankbait. Is there just so many categories now that what happens is anglers chase the trends of, well, the chatterbait's hot, so we only throw the chatterbait? Uh, cause it's interesting. There's just the nice thing about the chatterbait is, is that you can throw it places. You really can't throw a crankbait, Like some guys can believe me. Some guys can throw that crankbait some places so that I just put it go. I can't believe that thing came back. And the chatterbait gives you that ability. Right. And, and you know, I'll go, with, I'll go with the, um, the whopper plopper. I think the whopper plopper was so successful because you didn't necessarily have to have a cadence with it. <laughs> like you would with, a buzz bait, right? With a buzz mm -hmm. bait, you have to have a certain speed of your reel. You you've got to get those blades spinning fast. You can't let it sit there. And then the then the the, the whopper whopper came and it hit everybody like crazy. But it was basically a buzz bait that you could fish slow with, right? And it it threw more water than a than a lot of the other prop baits that, that are out there, like a cripple killer or something like that. They're all very effective, but I don't think that they they throw the kind of water. And the profiles is quite a bit different when you look at the whopper plopper. But you know, whether you're looking at a jerk bait that is a mega bass or a jerk bait that's the you know tried and true X wrap, right? Or something else that's out there, whether it's Realis or whatever you're looking at. It, it it it's there are some things about size and shape and how it works at certain times of the year. And 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 it's hard. Hard to argue sometimes with the success that Mega Bass has with, with some of their baits. But I've had yeah. equal success on days with you know far less expensive baits. I think we all want to be sexy. We all want to have the newest thing that's out there. We always all want to have the greatest stuff. Does it make does it make a difference in the end? I do think that there are some times that a different profile and a new profile can be a great thing. But you can't explain to me why that 1980s tube catches just as many, if not more, it, fish than everything else does. I, I think it depends. I think this really sets up. This is a class. You brought it up with Mega Bass. The baits that I would I would say Mega Bass set, excels at are their jerk baits. Why? It's a visual bait. 90% 90, 90 of it, I think, is visual in the profile. That's what really makes a smallmouth or a largemouth want to lock in on that thing. That's where you can get really creative with your paint designs and schemes. But if you go to vibration-based baits like a lipless or a crankbait, that's where you go to eBay and you find baits that aren't made anymore, uh, like silent lipless, if you can find them, and they sell. They look ugly as hell. Why do they work? Because it's like it's that noise. It's just a little freaking different. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think that's that's all. We have this conversation thing. all the time, you know, and I, you have to have both. So sometimes the rattles are a, are a plus. You know, they have the one knockers or the, the hard knocks or they're kind of good. And other times 
they don't want that thing making a lot of noise. They want something that's quiet, right? I mean, when a when a crayfish swims by, is there a little bit of a click that goes by with when their their shells are hitting? And what, is, what does it make a difference when they're when they're soft shell in that mode and you know they're not making nearly as much much noise? So <laughs> I know my partner Glenn Glenn loves quiet crankbaits, and I'm usually one that wants one that's a knocker. So, but there there is a, there is a time and a place. In size, sometimes they don't. They don't want a big profile. Sometimes that 1.0 or that 40 size just outmaneuvers the 60 size and the 1.5 or the 2. So I think mm. you got to play. I think you got to play a little bit. We got right now, we got over 65 people watching. We got uh, 49 on YouTube and Facebook combined, and we got a bunch more on Instagram. We got another interesting question. Like, do you think fish will ever get conditioned to the glide bait? This is J Bruce 12 on Instagram. Mm. Condition to live bait, like glide baits. The, the glide, oh, glide. Bait oh man, that's a cool bait. We talked about this maybe a while back. That's when I was on with Mikey. That is a great bait, a fun bait. It's a you got to be patient. Um, and uh, I don't know that that's one of those things I can always be is patient, but I think I think the glide bait market is still. There's somebody's going to come up with something because there's they're just so varied. Um, for the smallmouth world in the rivers, um, I really, for me personally, I think I like the the one hinge baits, right? The, the two piece versus the multiple multiple piece, just for me. Um, and I'm convinced that smallmouth do not understand size. They don't. They'll hit stuff that just I would never have thought they would hit. It's not every one. But I think that with the paint, yes, with the paint scales that are coming up and the that's tails, the fiber tails versus. Know. That's 12 inches. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how big those baits, those fish will hit. And, you know, there's, there's, there are some colors that work better, some, some shades that work better than others. And I think with the paint jobs that are coming, I still think that there's going to be I don't know they're going to get conditioned to them just too too fast because it's just not not from what I'm seeing yet. They really they have it with the jerk bait and they do stare at that they do stare at that bait a lot. But now let me put it this way: I hope not. That's a fun bait to fish. We got Travis Cyber. Travis Cyber says, "Chris, I love listening to you. The few times you came down to Jake's and spoke, very precise with your answers and highly knowledgeable. I've heard some people talk about two days out of the year to never fish. Have you ever had days like that where you just can't seem to catch a single one? And what would you do if that happens?" So, I've only been doing this for eighteen years, and I say only because there's guys who have been doing this for 40 and 45 years and bless their souls. That is just an amazing statement for anybody. It, it is truly a badge of honor to, to, to be able to say that you've done it for that many years. We have a 10 fish. We have a 10 fish rule. You don't catch 10 fish on the boat. You get your, you can pay us for $50 for our, our, our fuel fees. That's the only thing you pay. I've cashed that in twice in 17 years. Um, once we were really close to getting to the 10th fish, but it was really hard getting to the fish. And I just didn't feel comfortable taking someone's money at the 10th fish. So I gave him this option. I said, you know, listen, we're going to hit this 10th fish, but it's not going to be a banner day. Would you like to just reschedule? And we'll just pretend the day never happened. The three hours or four hours we were out killing, you guys were killing yourself to catch the fish. And like, it was like, the river was getting worse. It just wasn't, it wasn't one of those days where it just felt like it was going to happen. And the other time that it happened, oddly enough, I was with a biologist. I was with a fish biologist who told me, and I remember just, he said, you know, some days, Chris, the fish don't eat. I said, nonsense, nonsense. These fish are going to eat. They're just, we just got to find them. We just got to do it. And we tried. He was just relentless with, with telling me we're not going to find fish. And I just had everything in my inside me to, to find a few fish that would eat. And we found a few, but unintelligently, I always believe I can catch them, that I'm not doing something right. And somebody on this river in a different boat is catching fish right now. So I, I never say die. I like to catch them. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to beat anybody up over it, but I've experienced that day once when I mean, there's nothing I could do. I threw everything um, and I just couldn't get them to go. 
But I've had so many other days where it just seems like nothing was going to work. Nothing was going to work. And we picked up a white crankbait or a spinnerbait or, you know, a fluke or something like that that we used no weight on and just lit them up. So I think that two days a year, I mean, I fish about 200 and 225 days a year. So it might be two days that I haven't fished and it's cold or conditions are not right. There could be moon phases, but I fished a couple of moon phases where it was really tough on some of those super moons. And I fished some super moons when it's been good. Um, that's a great question. I would like to believe that they don't exist. Um, the ones that I've had, I've usually come on the top of, you know, I've usually figured out something during the day to get it to work. And, and believe me, my boat looks like crap afterwards because we've got every lure out and we've got all my rods out and we are throwing at everything. And we're looking for current, shallow water, deep water, slack water, dead water. We're dragging stuff in what I'll call carp water just to try to find some fish that's willing to, to, to take something. So one day, I mean, it was one day when I we just could not catch them. And I was with my biologist who was saying, I told you, I told you so. We feed these fish. Sometimes they don't eat it. It's like, come on. They're going to eat something in that in that particular day. We ended up rescheduling because it was, we could not get them. I think we had like six fish in the boat, and that was just one of the – I just literally was – I had marks on my forehead from smack and stuff. And going, this can't possibly be happening. But. Oh my gosh. Was, Travis, uh, yeah, message me, bud. As always, everyone that want a gift card, please message me, uh, uh, fishingthedmv at gmail.com, Instagram or Facebook, and you can uh, get your gift card. Matthew's got a really good question. Uh, what is your go to crankbait? Great question. Great question. So, years ago, I got turned on to the Aska 40, which I think was probably one of the best baits. It was made by Jackal. Probably the best square bill crankbaits ever made on the planet Earth. You can find these. They're really good. And I know that everybody who, who fishes these now realizes that there's no more to be had. And the ones you are going to find are very. So I can use that word. I can say which one is the incredible bait. Right now, I'm doing really, really good with just a KVD 1.5, you know, the or, or a 1.0. There are certain colors that I like. I like crawfish colors. They're, they're, they're really good. On the Delaware, we like... Um, Shad colors or silvers and, you know, silver, silver or white, they work really good. Um, not that the shad colors don't, but, you know, sexy shad type things, they, they work really good there. Um, on the main stem and the Juniata and the, the North Branch, that KVD is pretty slick. I mean, the Bandit 200 is really good. Um, there's the, there's a, a Yazori out there right now. I think it's a Yazori. 60 i think it is or 50 is already 50 is a pretty good one right now that that's that's been working well for me um i don't like to buy crankbaits that cost a lot of money because you're gonna lose them i mean mm -hmm. we're, we're talking, if you're gonna throw them like i tell you to throw them you're gonna lose a bunch of them and so i mean you're not gonna lose a bunch of a day but you know during the course of a week i'll lose five five crankbaits if we're not retying if we're throwing into really heavy stuff if because I like to, I like to make sure the crankbaits touch and bottom. I like to make sure that you know we're, we're digging at the bottom. Um, and I'll tell you, if you're not, if you're not catching on crankbaits, just vary your retrieval a little bit. Retrieve fast and slow up. Just pause it for a second. You know, sometimes you've got fish trailing it and it just doesn't move enough. It's not, it's not zigging or zagging. So if you just stop it for a split second and start it back up, you're gonna, you're, that fish is trailing. It's gonna destroy it. Right. So. Just throw it. And if you're not getting one on a crawfish pattern, something's wrong. In, in this river, if you're throwing a crankbait and you've got a crawfish pattern, it looks natural crawfish pattern. If, if you're throwing that and you're touching bottom every once in a while and you're not catching fish, make sure that thing has hooks on it. Okay? That's one of those things that's just going to work. Uh, all the people on my boat will go, I never throw a crankbait. And they throw it 15 times and they catch their first fish and go, oh, this is a blast. At the end of the day, you go, hey, I'm going to go, what kind of crank was I using? Because I'm going to go buy a couple of those because it just works. It just I, works. You need a system too. And I have like, I have a multiple systems, but I like how you said like varying the retrieve because when I was, when I was younger, um, and I think this was in our high school fishing days, honestly, and I got paired with a guy and he said, I was, I was just, I was trying to fish like a spinner base. Like you just crank it. He's like, what I want you to do is 
when you hit bottom, I want you to count every rock. And I was like, what the hell do you mean? I was like, I want you to try to count every rock. I want you to almost close your eyes and feel every rock and slow down to where you can every time feel it tick. I started catching them. I was like, you were telling me to slow down basically, but it's true. It it, it is so generally, I I, I generally rock it when I throw it in. I mean, I, I, I reel it really hard and then I slow down. And if I, if I hit bottom or if I feel like I'm on something, I'll just stop it for a second. And that, my hands where you can see it, that bait will just start to shimmy up and then it will just dart down. And a lot of times I'll say, hey, when you bring that back this time, stop it for a split second and then retrieve it. Or when you get it close to the boat, just slow it down a little bit and they'll catch a fish on the next one. They go, how did you know that? I said, I didn't know it. I just, I saw that you were just reeling it in and I thought maybe if you just slowed it down, that fish is trailing, it's going to eat it. Mm -hmm. So it's just one of those things where, you know, when you're bringing it in, if you just pause it for a second or if you vary your, your speed just a little bit once in a while, I mean, it doesn't mean you have to go crazy. You don't have to move off. Just, but just, just get it down there and, and make sure. And sometimes, Bill, if you're in four to six foot of water, almost anything's going to work, right? But if you start to get yourself into really like eight foot of water, or seven foot of water, and you're, you're, that, that bait just can't get down deep enough, you just need to go to a bigger lift or a bigger profile or, high, or more speed. Would you There's change so many different things out there. I mean, there, I know guys who buy um, who buy stuff, the cheapest stuff they can find, and then they just repaint them. I mean, they they, they like to to play with the paint schemes. I, and they, yeah. I agree with you because it, this is the same thing. Why I think these things are a nightmare is because I've been in a boat with a guy who he will try to almost get this thing snagged in thirty feet of water. Like I can't do that because I don't want to lose it. It's the same with the crankbait. If you're not getting it into like some yucky stuff, you're not going to make it work. So why spend 50 bucks on a crankbait? You know, get a bunch that are a little cheaper that if you lose them, no big deal. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and there's just, uh, I've, I've seen, we'll go back to the weight thing. I've seen weight baits that were just absolutely looked like they went through hell. And the guy wouldn't sell it to you for any amount of money because that that one works. And it's, you know, it's got a wire hanging off of it and it's not pretty anymore. It's got half the tail bristles gone, but there's something about that one that's working. So, you know, there, there may be something about the the, the weight bait as the expense of the weight bait versus the crankbait. But if you've got, if you've got a crankbait, I don't care if it's a big O or if it's a KVD or if it's a, a Uzori, or if you really feel that you have to have a mega bass and I'm not, I'm not going to, if you want to get that, that bait, I just don't throw them because we decorate the trees with them. We decorate the bottom of the river with them. And, you know, I just I just want something that's got decent hooks on it. And if I can't find the hooks I like, I'll just swap them out. So if I've got to buy a really expensive bait and i got to swap the hooks out on it anyway, I just would rather buy a cheaper bait. The biggest thing is making sure that they run straight. Right? You don't want one that's going to gonna spin on you or turn sideways. I think that's a turn off to the fish. So if you can hit bottom with it, and you can, you know, there will be days when they want a slower wobble. And so, you you know, you might have to go to a more of a peanut size. But most of the time, one of those three sizes is going to work, you know, the 40, the 50, the 60. Those are going to work. And when I say 40, 50, 60, I mean a 1.0, 1.25, or a 1.5. And then there's like, like the other day, one of the twos. <laughs> I gave them twos. So you know, Tommy, Tommy Merritt, uh, Tammy Merritt, sorry, I can't speak english apparently uh i am new to river fishing how much do you use a fish finder in new water also have you used the strike king hunter so i use uh, my i use mine a lot but i don't use it for what for finding fish i use mine for you know reading the surface temperature because the bottom is not going to be too much different in the river because it's, it's all mixing um i use it to see what cover kind of bottom i have so if i'm not familiar with the area I want to know depth, temperature, and I want to know what kind of bottom I have. Um, that's what I mostly use mine for. If you're really going to be fishing deeper rivers, and I mean things that are that are 15, 16, 17, 25 feet deep, and you're looking for humps, and you really want to get into something that has like a, a 360 or a live scope, those things are wonderful. But in the river that I'm fishing down here, I mean, quite honestly, a really deep hole is seven and a half feet. And, then, and I don't think that the fish and the size of my, you know, I'm in four to seven feet right now all day long. And I think that with the band of my, of what I'm looking at, um, I don't think that I can see the fish under the boat. 
I just know they're there because there's a currency. So if it's wintertime fishing, uh, that makes a, bit, a big difference. Or if you're looking for, you know, catfish or walleye, I think it's a, it's a big difference. But for a smallmouth bass fisherman in the river, when your river is, you know, three quarters of a mile wide and two and a half to five feet deep, I don't know that your cone width is big enough to grab it. And I don't have a really, I don't dislike, you know, side imaging stuff. I just don't use it a lot. Right. I just I just find my fish. Now, wintertime's a different story. Wintertime, you can really make good use of it. And as far as that other, what was that king? What was the name of the um Yeah, Strike the, King Hunter? Yeah, I have not used that. Let's see. And then guys, make sure you get your questions in because we're not gonna be going for six hours tonight. So get your questions in now. Uh we got Long Peng uh that asks uh he's straight to the point here. What are the smallies hitting on the Susquehanna? Um, crankbaits. That's right now they're hitting crankbaits really well. Um, they're hitting tubes and creature baits really well. You just have to find the size and the color they want. It varies a little bit every day. It's um, I'm, I'm not really using anything that's more than four inches and nothing smaller than three. Uh, right now, that three and a half, three and a quarter, three and a half, three point seven five is really the key in size. You can use net rigs if you like, um, and you're going to catch big fish on the net rigs too. Some people think you won't, but you do happen to get a lot of those smaller fish on the net rigs because they're just, you know, they're going to eat that stuff. <laughs> um, spinner baits, I have not, I had a real good spinner bait bike going a couple weeks ago and it's just kind of faded on me, which I'm really upset about. But um, right now, so I'm, I'm going to say tubes are working great. Um, creatures are working very good. Today, uh, we put on a, I think last week when the water was a little dirtier, we were throwing the palmetto bug and that size creature. And then today we were throwing a much smaller one. We were using the um, the, the net bug and doing fairly, hmm. fairly well. What is with the, the swim baits also? Oh yeah, the glidey stuff and the yeah. swims. What's <laughs> with the cult around tube versus Ned rig? Because I feel like it's the cowboys versus the redskins. Like there are people that will only throw tubes. There are people that only throw Ned rigs. I know. And, it, and it's, it's an absolute, I mean, the, the tube is hard to be. It really is. It, it, it is. And there's just some types of water, some days with the certain levels and the wind where the tube just seems to go through the water better and days when the net just seems to go through the water better. Um, the, I believe it's crush city makes a little bit longer Ned rig, um, can't remember the name of it. Uh, it. Might be a BLT, the Crush City BLT. That thing is just a little bit bigger than the the traditional Ned rig, and I think I like that a little bit better. Um, there's also so many different profiles for the Ned that just makes it a little bit more powerful than the tube at times, right? There's paddle tail Ned paddle tails. There's Ned bombs. There's the creature baits. There's you know, you can fish, uh, you know, crawl baits on it. You know, they, you can even fish some tubes on some of the Ned rigs. <laughs> I I have people in my boat who will not fish a Ned rig. I don't I think that it gets, I don't know, they won't fish it. They'll fish a tube instead. And I have other people that will just fish anything that, that, that you want to. And they're both successful, so I don't know why you would want to go away from it. I think the colors that are available in these, these Ned profiles the, the laminates and stuff are just hard to beat and i'm glad you mentioned that because like the bfs <coughs> culture i think has changed smallmouth fishing a lot because now big companies are making stuff that are smallmouth size whether it's walking baits poppers crankbaits it's really fascinating um we had like a bunch of people join in let's see jake says mm -hmm. uh thomas you're live on makbf page two i know i just sorry about that i will see if i can if that's an issue, Jake, let me know. I just hit go live and everything that was connected just kind of did it because I was running behind today. Uh, I'm going to butcher this name. Savas? Sav Savas. Savas. Thank you so much. Savas. It's like Travis. This is how he told me. It's like Travis, but with an S. Thank you. Savas. Chris is the smallmouth whisperer. Uh, Caesar, Caesar Milan of bass fishing. Um, <laughs> ben E., uh, do you change up the color of your crawl pattern crankbaits throughout the season? Do the crawfish change colors a lot in the Susquehanna? They do. They do. And and um, I, I don't change my color because of the color of the crayfish, although I do change my tubes based on the color of the crayfish. So if you've ever seen old videos of me, you'll see me.
flipping over stones or taking a little net to see what what I can grab out of the leaves or the rocks in the wintertime to see what color the crayfish are. And then I will mimic my presentation to look exactly like that blue bottom crayfish we tend to get in the colder weather. What I've been doing is throwing crayfish patterns and the brighter colors when the water is the dirtiest and lighter, more natural colors when the water is crystal clear. Um, it seems to work. Um, I've had success with it. I don't know if that's something I would hang my hat on. Um, it's worth experimenting with, but I really don't change the colors based on what the color of the crayfish are when I'm crankbaiting, but I do change it with my soft bottoms a lot. So it, in my crankbait, I have like six colors and I use the brighter ones when the water is really, really stained and the lighter colored ones when it's clear, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it's really interesting. I don't think a lot of when you guys get into this like super heavy and unhealthily addicted, you start realizing how much fish change or not fish. The forage will change colors, whether it's the emerald shiner, depending on where they're located, crayfish, depending on the time of year. It's just absolutely fascinating to me, like how much they evolve and they change. Um, let's see. We got, <laughs> we got two more questions here. Where was that last one? Uh, we got John here. John, you just want a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me on Facebook or Instagram or email me fishingdmv at gmail.com. Uh, have you used blade baits? Oh, absolutely. Yes, blade baits work great. Um, I don't use them when this time of year. I usually use them from like November all the way to the beginning of maybe the middle of March. Um, and that's because the water I'm fishing is usually much deeper. But I love blade baits. Blade baits are fantastic. I have about 90 pounds of them. Um, and when I use them, I plan on losing them because I like to I like to be on the bottom. I like to be in snags. So, you know, I absolutely do love blade baits. Um, I usually have a company that makes them for me. I don't buy a silver body or a cicada, but um, I really do like them. And I don't buy those ones because... I honestly will go through 10 in a day because <laughs> um, I throw it out and my, my method of, of using it in cold water is I throw it out, let it sink to the bottom and touch the bottom. And then I rip it off the bottom and I have a certain way that I retrieve it that just, if, if I'm in a snaggy area, I'm going to lose one every once in a while. So, but great bait. And I throw them heavy. I like them to be half ounce. I like the big ones. I don't like, and I, and I don't care how cold the water is. They'll eat the things. You brought up an interesting thing, and maybe this this could be kind of like our 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 changing topics here is with the cicadas. Do you how much will the cicadas impact the river this year? Because I heard some rumor like there's going to be like a billion of them coming out this year, or some crazy number. So a couple of years ago, we had a really big one, and the top water bite was pretty phenomenal, right? So I think I think if they're if they're landing in the water and the fish get tr triggered on them, and I, I mean, I think that it could be a great time for anything that makes a lot of noise on the on the surface of the water. So I think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think if they start to to to, to dominate, they, when something's on the top of the water, I don't think they think it's a insect or a fish. They just think it's something they can eat, and if they eat it and like it, you know, I watched bass. 15 years ago in southeastern Pennsylvania, eating those lantern flies and spitting them back out. They still they still ate them. They, they still took them out, but then they spit them out. But they still hit them on the surface. And I don't know if they ever got conditioned to them or not, but that day I was on the water, they were hitting them, and then you'd see them spitting right back out. Jeez, so either so they didn't taste well or what was going on. But I've seen cicadas land in the water. I've seen dragonflies you know, crash land in the, in the water, and it doesn't take long before a bass eats it. So you know the companies that mimic that cicada they're bringing that cicada bug back and it'll be it'll be something it'll, it'll work it'll be good it'll be great a great food source for a lot of things right and for, certainly for the bass so if it's going to trigger if it's going to trigger a bite on the surface i'm all for it 100 percent. and then if you guys that like to fly fish i remember travis eden the kingfisher told me like there was the greatest topwater carp bite ever uh and he had guys that would go out that one year and you could just fly fish and catch almost every carp in the river on top water. It was crazy. Let's see. We got two more questions here, guys. And then we're probably going to be starting to wind this thing down. Let's see. Uh, couple says, what size line do you run on your bait caster? Any preference in type with so many to choose from? Oh, that's a great question. That is a great question. 
I, I don't think that you can just have one. And this is this is not the question your answer looking for. So if I'm throwing if I'm throwing a smaller jerk bait, um, I honestly believe a fluorocarbon line is the best, either that or copolymer is the best line to have for it because those smaller baits need to sink a little bit more and you have great feel with that stuff and it's just a it's just a great tool to use if i'm using a chatter bait and i'm throwing it in this nasty stuff i'm going to throw it on 40 pound braid which i know doesn't sound very fun and you get no stretch but when I'm throwing it into wood and, and into a lot of the stuff that I'm throwing, I need to be able to beef it out of that situation. So I'll use that, that bait. And then if you have a big swing in your temperature during the day, and I know a lot of guys who fish glide baits know this, but if you have a lot of temperature swing in your day where your water in the spring and fall will go down into the 40s and then into the 50s, you know, it'll, it'll fluctuate throughout, throughout the day. The difference your bait will work on pure mono versus fluorocarbon is significant. So hmm. you can have a bait that you love and is catching fish all morning long and that heat gets on the water and all of a sudden you're not catching fish on that bait, but your buddy is. Your buddy's probably throwing a different line. So fluorocarbon will sink at a, at a faster rate in more dense water than, than you will have when you're throwing a, a so I know the I know the the crazies out there, and I'll call them crazies because I would probably be one if I wasn't a smallmouth fisherman. But if you're glide bait guys and you're fishing a lot of different temperatures, you're going to have at least two or three different spools of line on yours because you want your bait to be at a certain level, at a certain cadence, um, and you notice the difference. I mean, a lot of these guys want the bait two foot under the surface right or less and if they're they'll 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 change their line during the day because the bait will do different things based on the temperature of the water so for me i have fluorocarbon on on most of them on the ones i'm going to throw into really bad stuff i'm going to have heavy duty um you know strict you know the super lines and then for my some of my finesse stuff like the crankbait i really like to throw my crankbait on the bait caster with you know the stretchy old stuff. You know I, I really like the the monofilament for my crankbaits. If everything was equal, let's say so, it's we're dealing with all ten pound tests across the board. What casts farther, braid fluorocarbon or monofilament? Hmm, that's a really good question. Wow, that's a great question. I like six pound six pound um, fluorocarbon is probably the best casting stuff, but you really got to get that on the line correctly, right? You, it's, it's just, uh, my buddy uses Sunline on his spinning gear and on his casting gear, and he goes about two pounds lighter than I would be comfortable with. So six pound on his spinning gear and eight pound on his um, bait casters. That stuff Thanks. just casts, just dreamy, just, just dreamy. But you've got guys who are throwing some of the super slick stuff, you know, the, the super lines, and they cast really well too. I don't know. I, there's just something about brand new line, brand new monofilament, or brand new fluorocarbon that just really casts so nice. And then you have to realize that you know some guides, some guides, and some roll. Well, it, it's a combination between the 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 line and the and the the rod that you have, the action of the rod. You know, some rods load up better in cast, but other rods. I agree with that too, because you get into like, especially like spinning stuff, like the diameter of your spool will increase. But you can take the same line on the same reel and have one professionally installed, right? And the other one, you just do it in your living room and you don't quite get it as tight as it needs to be. And it doesn't cast as well as the one that was put on the spool tight, right? So fluorocarbon's a pain sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to use warm water or, you know, let it sit for a while or have it, you know, once, but once you find one that works, it's it's a pretty sweet deal. Do you use braid to floor a leader with your clients for spinning reels, or do you do. just go? Okay. Yeah, I do. I I I am a big. I don't go long. I go four to six feet on my fluorocarbon leaders, but I'm a big fluorocarbon leader guy. I like that. Even though I, 
will tell you that, that knot, that leader knot is your is your your hitch pin, right? That that is your weak point. On it. But I just think that that there's so many advantages to fluorocarbon that it's worth it. What's your knot? FG? The FG knot. I like the FG knot. I play with it. I have like six knots that I tie. It will change on the days. If you use the reverse Albright and you tighten up your line as you're, you know, as you, if you can get your, your wraps over top of your wraps and you can come through the same hole that you started at and pull them, you know, moisten it and pull it tight, that's a hard knot to beat. But if it's windy out and you've got it and you're not sure where the line has to go in, if you go in the opposite way, if you don't come out the same way you went in, that knot's useless. I mean, it's going to come apart in 10 casts, right? So the FG knot, I suppose if you're an angler that has time to sit there and tie it at night, but I might tie 15 knots during the day, 15 meter knots during the day if it's a, if it's a bad client. <laughs> I don't have time to tie 15 FG knots. But on the weekends, when I'm going through all my equipment, the FG knots what's going to be tied on everything to start the week out. Hmm. I can sit. And it's, it's, a, it's the best knot. It just takes forever to tie. And it's I, terrible. Terrible to tie in the wing. Terrible. Oh, my God. It, it really but I've used like every knot. People send me knots all the time, and I'll use them. And they're usually really pretty knots, they're great casting knots, but they have no knot strength. So either they're breaking right before the knot, right? Because they they're just so tiny and they've cinched down so so tight. And every time you set the hook on something, it just gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and it breaks right at the knot. I just I'm afraid of losing a big fish on knot. So that FG or the crazy Alberto, until I find something that works better. There's a figure eight knot that I'm tying. I really like it, and it's it's holding up pretty good. But I don't know if I ever want to trust a six pound bass on one of those. We got two questions left, and one has a little levity. Uh, uh, PA Kayak Bassin on Instagram says, uh, Chris, who is your fourth favorite kayak angler behind Jeff Little, uh, Juan Jed, of course? My fourth favorite? <laughs> I'm not answering that question. No way. I'll tell you this much there are some awesome, awesome kayak anglers out here. Uh, nothing to take away from Jeff or, or Jed, and I haven't fished enough with Juan, although we fished quite a bit, you know, years and years ago. But there are some absolute incredible, I mean, I have them as clients, just incredible guys on that kayak. I mean, the kayak fishing has, I mean, there's some superstars in our area. There really is. There's some really good kayak fishermen. I mean, I would never want to go up against them. They, they, what they can do in a kayak, I have a jet boat. I can go almost anywhere I want to go. I can repeat water. I can do stuff. But some of these kayak anglers are just, they're just consistently really, really good. There's a couple guys, local guys here that I just, I'm not giving you a fourth because there are just so many really good ones out there that it's just, it's a great question, but I'm not answering it. There's a lot of really good kayak anglers and, and, and they're just, they're just getting better all the time. I agree with that. Um, let's see. Brew Tank Outdoors. Last question. Where did Thomas launch from and catch him on, on to get the top 10 this weekend? I am doing a live stream <laughs> Brew Tank, um, and I'm doing a live stream tomorrow to go through all that stuff because uh, every time tidal fishing starts up, I get a thousand phone calls and emails like, people don't know how to fish tidal. I want to break it down. It's so simple. It'll drive you mad. I will break that down tomorrow because that, that's a whole different conversation, boss. Um, the last thing I had for you, though, and I thought this was fascinating, and you're the guy to do it. When it comes to the two large smallmouth, at least from the studies I've looked through, it's weird how you don't see a lot of like the 10 pound, nine pound class, but then in the new river has produced them and different rivers have. There's a ton of great fish, but why is it? It seems like it doesn't produce that next caliber or am I mistaken? No, that's a great question. Why do certain rivers, um, I fish a couple of rivers in New York that consistently produce six and seven pounders consistently, right? They just do. They, and they, they, they're, you know, and some of it is because they're coming from, from the lake and if you catch them usually in the spring and fall when they, re, you know, they return to the creeks or they're, they're out foraging in the creeks. The Susquehanna, why we don't see very many sixes, I'm not really sure. That's a great, I mean, it's a great question. It's, it's, do they exist? I don't know that there's very many above six. I mean, there's just, when I say above six, yes, there are a few out there, but man, I'm telling you, it, it, we had two fives last week and 
I'm telling you legitimately throughout the course of a year, sorry about that guys, throughout the course go. of the year, um, maybe, maybe 10, 15. Is it genetics? Can, I don't know if it's genetics or if it's just how much, how much effort they have to burn in the river. Right. I mean, if you look, if you go, if you fish Champlain and there's current in a lake, but if you fish Champlain or Erie or, you know, those places, you're going to find those seven and eight pounders. I mean, if you fish it long enough, you're going to get those bigger fish. But, but in the, in the rivers, I'm not so sure that with all the, all the work they have to do to get their, to get their forage, that they're ever going to be, we don't have gobies. The gobies have seen a change. They've been game changers for some of these places. The new river, it, the new river is nothing new, right? And seriously, the new river for 20 years, that place has been just, just people have been catching giants on that place, right? It's never been a fishery where you go and catch a hundred or rarely, right? But man, when you get a big fish there, it's, there's some just it's monsters on that place, right? But you also have a different forage base, right? I mean, you, you're, are you Cisco Shad down there? When they would do those water releases in some of those places, I mean, if you didn't have a water release, you weren't, when I was fishing, if you didn't have a water release, you weren't really catching. But when they did water release, they were throwing up what looked like shad to me, either Cisco shad or some kind of a big bait fish that, I mean, if I, I didn't didn't recognize it when I was down there, whether it was a, um, you know, ally for a goat, but something was feeding these fish that made them just, so I don't know if they come out of the reservoirs where they're releasing from, and that's what makes it all go, or if there's something down there that's just making these fish monstrous, or if the that the, the weather down there is a little bit softer than our, our northeast weather that that's making them be able to feed a little bit more throughout the year not not waste time because on a cold winter they're going weeks sometimes without a meal i think and that 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 does mm. take a little bit of the body weight away i think it's fascinating because like i know for like the new they also have the rust the invasive species which is the rusty crawfish but it gets we like 12 inches too. long yeah um, we don't have them that big but we do have them here I mean, we remember the first guy here that I remember, you know, talking to the fish commission and they were worried about it because it's like, well, nothing's going to eat those. And I can tell you right now, that the bass don't care. They don't look at it and go, you know, that that five inch rusty crawfish looks dangerous to me. I'm not they, they may spit it out a couple of times before they grab it and break it back, but they're going to hear a swallow if they one way or the other. Do you think without giving it away, there are rivers in upstate New York that could actually bring out some trophies in the next couple of years? I know guys that are. I know guys that are very serious about doing it. Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of them. They're and they're either attached to. They're they're attached to that strain that has the gobies in them, right? So whether That's it's what, okay. yeah, they're, so they're, if, if it's you know in, in New York, those rivers that have the gobies because of the lakes are getting the gobies, and they're just they're spreading out and they're getting big and they just they're crushing it. They're I mean, I fish these places almost my entire life and go back to them now and think, what in the world? This is, I mean, it was nothing to get two and three pounds, and now it's nothing to get, you know, every day four or five fish over five pounds in these, these rivers right now. Good Lord, that's insane. I can't do that in Susquehanna. I mean, I've had plenty of days where we've had eight or nine fish over four, and a couple of days where you'll have, you know, a five or even two fives split the when it's when it's just incredible. But most of the, I mean, I can go a whole week or two without ever getting five. Maybe, maybe three weeks sometimes I'll get even close to five. So it's just, you know, right now, if you're looking for a big fish, this last week and the weeks that are coming up before the spawn are probably your best chance at really getting a legitimately solid five, five and a half. We've, we've done it three times in the last five days. And I think that this week we'll do it a couple more times, and I think next week we'll do some. Chris, and then I think it's going to be really hard to get them. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, at, you know, guys, as always, I already have the links up to all of his social media handles. Um, again, Chris, is there anyone that we can promote, give a shout out to? No, I mean, just, just, there's so many great companies out there. Um, you know, Jig Masters is one that just has helped me out so much with the baits. A lot of the local tackle shops, you know, yours as well. Um, there's just, we 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 just we have a lot of great sponsors, um, but they're the same people that you guys are using, right? Whether it's Jig Masters or whether you're using Z-Man Baits, the uh, Big Joshy, there's just a bunch that are out there that are just great stuff. The tackle shop that's helped me out the most is probably Wacky Worm. They make a lot of custom colors for me, and 
course, fit custom movers, these smaller places that just have, have really opened our doors and allowed us to create some stuff. But listen, support your local tackle shop. That's what needs you the most right now. And, and that's you by supporting them, you're going to support all these other vendors and all these other partners that we have because they're almost all you know, selling through your tackle shop. And believe me, the guys who are, are, are working the tackle shop are working their hearts out to make their make their businesses work. So please, please, please visit, say hi, show up, you know, have a cup of coffee and buy some dates. And then as always, guys, link in the episode description so you can just please go go help support Chris, support your local uh, bait makers. It really means a lot. This is how we keep these communities going. And if also, guys, please check out our Patreon. Uh, I got permission from Virginia and Maryland departments to start a nonprofit to do supplemental stocking and habitat improvements. So come help support us there. Like and subscribe to the channel. We'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.